You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners. So, let's be friends. Welcome to the Bahrain Grand Prix Race Review. I know some people will be very disappointed. And I get that. I know in a period of domination, all but the fans of the dominant entity start the season hoping for a dramatic change of fortunes. Well, we didn't get it. But you can't give up just because there's loads of evidence that there's no hope and you should give up. But as bad as I think it looks, I think we can make the case that it's not as terrible as it might have first seemed. And there's a lot to talk about, so join me on a journey of exploration into the world of the new Formula One season. We are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind support of our patrons at patreon.com forward slash missed apex. We will bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. I'm joined in the shed by a kindly American, Matt Trumpets. You know, I had the strangest dream. I woke up this morning in a panic thinking there was a Formula One race, but then I remembered it was Saturday. So, Hugh, I've got until tomorrow. Formula One races belong on a Sunday. Like I said, I understand all the reasons for it, but today I was just interrupted constantly by the reality of a family Saturday. So we had to get ready for my daughter's birthday party. I had a teenage son 40 minutes before the race start saying to me, hey, uh, I did put my hand out for the bus driver, but the bus driver just didn't stop. I went, oh, yeah, lies, a likely story. Pull the other one. It's got bells on it. And so I literally I sat down with like a few minutes to go before the race. Formula One is for Sundays. Dads are not adaptable. Uh, we're also joined by another dad, Chris Catman Turner. Hello, Catman. Hey, Spanners. F1 is back and I'm loving it. Even if the race wasn't a banger, we still got plenty to talk about. Oh, you're a McLaren fan. So I get to McLaren at you. Oh, no. I think, no, I, I, think <laughs> I honestly think it was better than I expected from McLaren. I think there's a lot to be positive about. And we're joined by someone who claims falsely to be a neutral. It's Chris Stevens. Hello, Chris. Hey, Spanners, look, you know me. I am an optimist. I will sit here and I will say F1 will still be good this year until my commentary season starts and I don't have to watch F1 anymore. Oh, is that what it is? So you're, you're not in it for the long run, but I think all the fans in F1 should be in it for the long run. But there was a bit of a double whammy today. So not only did the dominant driver from last season be dominant again today, but also the race then didn't bang either so i think there's that general disappointment of everyone building it up from testing building it up from a weekend's worth of free practice qualifying and then got to the race and there's a feeling like chris we were we were let down like we were promised something more we were misled weren't we by not just not just by testing but by people like me <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you and Brad in our group chat saying, Mercedes have got it, guys. We're going to absolutely take the fight to Red Bull I today. never said, whoa, whoa, calm down. I said they seemed like they seemed happy. And they did word seem happy. Word for word. It isn't said. word for word. Le <laughs> legally and, and legitimately not word for word. But um, there's, there's a lot, Matt, of coulda, woulda, shoulda around the grid sort of except Red Bull. But I think we can I'll paint a, a more positive picture than what we saw, you know, in, in real time. Uh, oh, yeah, I would completely agree. Right here, what we're looking at is a lot of already admitted problems. Not enough to keep any car from finishing, but enough to keep a lot of cars from finishing where they might have. And it would have been a much more interesting race had they not made those mistakes. And But it is worth saying that the answer to every coulda, shoulda, woulda is, well, Red Bull didn't have that problem. Red Bull smashed it out of the park, 100%. But I think it's a little bit unlucky the way that the race also was a very standard F1 race. So we've all been watching F1 for longer than we all care to admit. But I mean, Catman, you're super old. You know, like races in the, in the late 90s, for example, you wouldn't even get as much strategy and intrigue as, as that. So for me, that was a good strategic race, fundamentally. It's just that there wasn't like, you know, cars on fire. 
Yeah, absolutely. There were some good overtakes. There was some great driving from a few drivers there. And yeah, Max finished a pit stop ahead of everybody else. But did anybody really expect anything different? I don't think no, they did. No, no. And the rest of the field had some good battles. Not all of them came to fruition as much as we'd have liked them to, but there was still intrigue there. I think some of the best races that have ever been shown on television are ones where there's been very few overtakes. So just because there's not been on-track dicing doesn't mean that it's not interesting. All right. So I think today we're going to explore that Red Bull domination. Have any of the teams got low-hanging fruit that might get them up the grid? And who's scoring better than we expected? I think we have to start, though, with the phenomenon that is Max Verstappen and Red Bull. Matt, simply phenomenal from Red Bull. How, where, why, what are they doing that no one else can do? Uh, Well, for starters, they're getting pole position in qualifying because they get this amazing toe from Oscar Piastri, which really didn't necessarily look like it was on until that very, very last lap. So, I mean, if you're if you're Max Verstappen, this is this thing in New York where you have to take three different trains. And when you go to the first train, it's right there. When you go to your connection, the next one is there. And when you go to that connection, the next one is there. It was unbelievable. He drew (laughs) He drew a royal flush with nothing, um, aside from you know the brilliance of the car in general. Everything went right for him, and it went righter for him than it even did for Perez, who started fifth, but did struggle with understeer and had some complaints about the car after the race. The thing about qualifying now is that it seems so much tighter than ever before between uh between red bull ferrari uh mercedes and even mclaren and you know even throw aston in there because fernando was decent in qualifying uh certainly compared to the race pace anyway and i know it doesn't look like it because max was quarter of a second head in the end but i think that toe is probably responsible for a, a big portion of that advantage it would have been a lot closer had he not got that which i, I a lot of people haven't actually been talking about so there, there is still opportunities now. It's, we're entering like this Formula E level of closeness almost, where like one tenth of a second you miss in in your qualifying lap can cost you two rows on the grid, and that I think makes qualifying a more important than than ever because we see like the effect with Lewis Hamilton, for example, well, because he had yeah. a bad quality and he slips right back. So we can't let Max get on pole position, or we can't let him lead into turn one. Only a millennial though fan could say that this is the most important quality has been ever because 90s F1 would would love a word with you. (laughs) Jerno truly has something to say about this. But your point is well taken because, you know, in recent years we've said qualifying is, is, is almost been an irrelevance and it was never been less important over the last few seasons. So if you have a lot of field spread, then... And you have cars that can overtake, which we, we have. We have got cars that can overtake at the moment. Then it doesn't really matter where in the order you are. You're gonna generally shuffle to where you should be. So when Mercedes were, I don't know, the third fastest car on a given weekend, and Hamilton did a weird going out in Q1, he'd still sort of broadly end up where where Russell is. So that might change now that the field. And when we say the field, can we just take it as red that that doesn't include Max at the moment? So the field is closer up, especially on that one lap performance. And from what we saw today, much closer on race pace. So it is going to be critical this season. I don't think you can pull a Lewis Hamilton week in, week out going, ah, quality doesn't matter. I think this season it's, it's going to matter. Catman. Absolutely. And we looked at, in our testing review, we looked at saying, oh, Ferrari might be a little bit ahead on one lap pace, but then Mercedes might have it during the race. But as you rightly said, I don't think that really matters anymore. Quali pace is crucial because those gaps in the race are so tight that it just doesn't, you can't have that big delta and set your car up for the long run anymore because everybody's tuned into that a few years into the regulation sets and we're, we're all getting much, much closer. And you've got to look at it as this is a good circuit for overtaking as well. And even then, Lewis got stuck behind the McLarens for quite a lot of the race. And he just wasn't able to pull what George was doing up the front to get past the Ferraris. For some reason, his car or him or something just wasn't performing as well to be able to to move through like he sometimes can do. 
we almost have this weird scenario where rival teams like McLaren, Mercedes, and Ferrari need to actually work together on tra- <laughs> on track to try oh, and stop Max. That's really funny. From, from getting a pole or from leading into turn one. I think had Charles managed to jump Verstappen into turn one, we'd have ended up with a slightly different type of race because you see once he he's able to pull that one second, he's going into the distance and you're not going to see him again. So you need to disrupt him. And what we often end up seeing is they're t- too busy knocking seven bells out of each other. And that just makes Max's job even easier. I think you mispronounced signs in this instance. Uh, Leclerc had a mechanical that would never have let him do what you're imagining. But yes, rule number one is don't let Max be in the lead. And they even changed the rules this year because DRS is now enabled after the very first lap to help prevent that from happening. And I think it worked a lot to keep the rest of the field close. Um, But in this instance, it didn't work to keep Max uh, within range of his immediate competitors. So at the moment, we still have only one one data point at the moment. So what we don't know is, was Max cruising up front? Well, I I look at the, the, the fuel saving figures, if you like. There was a period in the race, I think at the end of the first stint, where everybody was... Uh, preserving their tyres, trying to extend that stint a little bit. And and most of the midfield, so from Perez all the way down to, I think, Hamilton then, if you like, the McLarens and Hamilton, they were all running very similar tyre-saving pace. And then you look up at Verstappen, also tyre-saving, it was about a second a lap faster. It's a lot easier to tyre safe when you're not having to defend or attack, though, yeah, isn't true. it? Because if you've got clear air, you've not got any dirt yet, the, the field is so close that I don't remember seeing any back markers until lap 50 or something. So you're not having to go offline, get your tires dirty. You're not having to sit in the, in the wash of other cars. So it is a lot easier to manage your tires. You can do fuel saving with lift and coast, which another thing that Max is particularly good at is being able to lift off the throttle before the corner, but yet not lose much time through the corner by braking later. So He's able to preserve his car, his tires, and his fuel much better than those others behind him. So it may look like he's he's still cruising, but he's able to keep that pace up despite that. Well, yeah, and 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 cooling not just of the tires, but cooling of the entire car as well. We saw our engineers telling telling uh, cars to pull out of the draft to cool the car, and we know that. Both the Mercedes and Williams had cooling issues with their power units. But here's a little fact. If you go back and look at Hulkenberg's time, because he had to pit and was on the hard tires and he was a pit stop behind, he was actually running at one point. He was running pace that matched the front runners on the hard tires. So clear air really matters a lot to these cars and running in traffic can disguise the the real pace that uh, a platform might have. But don't you also love when like a little something like that happens and it's like, great, we've got a data point on how the hard tire is yeah, going to yeah, run. Yeah. Oh, it actually looks pretty good, that tire, doesn't it? Good like job we saved two of them. Yeah, it was immediately obvious as soon as Hulkenberg started posting laps as well. That makes it obvious that the undercut is going to be massive. And that had a huge effect on the race tactically, Matt, because you know someone like Albon, who had loads of tires left, he couldn't, he couldn't extend the stint. So an overcut sort of made no sense. The only person who could do that was Verstappen because he was off in the distance. Uh, Well, yeah, I mean, he clearly sacrificed some race time up front to be very fast at the end. And and Red Bull did this last year, too, with their tires. They went soft, hard, soft. So this wasn't a surprise strategy from them. And uh, yeah, Albon actually ran kind of late for the midfield. He ran all the way to lap 14 when you had people like Joe uh betting around lap eight or nine stroll too i think very early pit so here's a cut uh, re- why, why was red bull so brilliant then so uh, max didn't have to do a lot of racing but we saw into turn one he had to do what needed to be done against leclerc and and forced leclerc to check up which then puts him on the back foot for the whole of that that corner so yeah so so max is absolutely clinical in these situations and here the clerk technically had space to stay on the track but verstappen crowded him was aggressive enough he had to check up and then suddenly he's looking behind you know and that's max immediately in corner one of the first race of the season going i, I am massively in control here 
Yeah, and Max has done the work on that in previous years. You don't want to be going side by side with him on the outside of the corner because he just won't give you any room. So Leclerc already knows that he can't put his car there or risk either going off onto the dust and losing two or three places. Um, So Max basically just has to just drive a slightly conservative line and say, look, you're not coming past regardless of what you do. And, uh, and that's great because he's in a very commanding position from there onwards. His first couple of laps were blistering pace. You could just see that gap opening to exactly where he needed it to be. And he knows that the first lap has to be perfect to be a second ahead, as Matt said with the DRS, now opening after that first lap, which is great if you can keep in it. I think Leclerc was just in it for that first lap, but it wasn't enough for him to, to stay in touch, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly here, I'm going to accuse Leclerc of being selfish and not playing the real team game by just staying there so Max hits him and they both have to pit early. And then we have an interesting race. So so there you go. There's your first whose fault is it? Leclerc, how dare you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> a bit joking about that. No, but the second thing that I think is, is really key with that Red Bull is that they haven't stood still and everyone has, has messed up. It feels like the whole field has taken a step up. Red Bull have just taken a, a mega step up and nailed it and not done anything wrong, not made any weird setup decisions, and, and they look to have made a step forward. So what is it about that new concept that's taken a step forward? And I think James Allison probably gave us a clue by saying he wanted to look at the ducting in that upper side pod. So it looks like a lot of the other teams were struggling with overheating, particularly the Mercedes and and the Williams. Uh-oh, so a bit of a pattern here. And if you look at the you know the, the hyper importance in the off season we were talking about cooling with the engines is that if you can get more heat away from that power unit you can run it higher so have red bull unlocked some mystical magical thing in that in that ducting in that upper portion of the chassis that means they can run a lot higher engine mode without burning up sorry Catman, well, you had need- your oh matt 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 Sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to jump in ahead of other people. But what I would say is like, yes, absolutely. Cooling is crucial to, to the amount and the mode that you can run your power unit. The cooler it runs, the, the better your combustion is, the more efficient it is, the more power you get for uh, the level of fuel you burn. But I don't think that's going to be by any means the only place that Red Bull uh, will have been pulling a blinder on their competition. And I don't have this as a fully sourced story, but I believe they may also have found some new analytical tools or a new way to use their current analytical tools that are more efficient than their competition. And that's helping them stay ahead on all the fronts. I'm not saying what they're doing is illegal, because I'm not, but I think they found a trick that the other teams haven't yet. I think what's really brave is that they didn't just stick with an evolution of their previous design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've, you know, gone you know, completely torn up the previous one and gone, what can we do that's different? Which is it is fantastic. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's definitely impressive. And you have to put your, your hands in the air and say, Well, that was an absolutely you know, they've they've come up with a, a phenomenal phenomenal design again, but also operationally they look to have nailed anything. So I think the slightly more interesting story here is and um, sorry to Perez, well done, P2, but, you know, well, I don't, I, I'm a Perez fan. I can't get excited about that P2 particularly because he was 18 seconds off the, the pace. Yeah, it was, it was P2 by the skin of his teeth, really, because he was having to fight much harder than he should have been with those Ferraris, even though they were having problems. It took him a while to get past. And I must say it was the qualifying that let him down that meant he had to go and do that fighting because if he was alongside Max he might have just been able to scamper away like him have better tire management like him so yeah I think I think unfortunately Perez is qualifying was his undoing this weekend okay so the first if you want hope right and the only way I can give anyone hope for the season is to point out all the ways in which people could have done better today yeah so that that's the only thing we're looking at if, if Red Bull were perfect and that looked to be the gap um, well if Verstappen was perfect and that looked to be the gap you can say everybody else was in a fight. Everybody else in that running order was having to overtake or defend, and Verstappen didn't have to do that because he'd, he'd earned his way into that position. So is that disguising some some potential pace? So let's start off with Ferrari. <laughs> 
Interesting to note, Carlos Sainz finishes in P3, and there are no Ferrari team members ready to greet him um, at the end there. I think they were just a bit surprised, maybe, to, to have found themselves on the podium. Can I just say, I love when Carlos Sainz gets into a I'm going to make a statement on track mode. mode. Yeah. Because yeah. he knows how to make a statement on track. And, okay, yes, Charles had that uh, brake issue and uh, Russell, of course, the overheating and some sort of leak on uh, on his car as well. But he pulled some pretty monster moves, pretty punchy out there, and it's very clear that he's out to make a statement and say, you've fired the wrong guy and all you other teams should be standing up and watching me and bring me into your car for 2025. I know he says, I'm not thinking about my future. That's a PR line. Of course, he's thinking P about his PR future. line. Look, spot the PR person. There's another word for PR line. It's a lie. So he's, he's <laughs> not other letters. Two other letters. Not necessarily. It's a bending of the truth, Spanners. That was my job. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So with Carlos Sainz, last, you can imagine last season in that situation, he might be, have been awaiting for permission. Whereas this season, you know, it's, it's different. There's not really anything for him to lose. As long as he doesn't go running Charles Leclerc off, off track, he's just going to go. He's not going to wait for people to do inventing. He's just going to go for it. But uh, today, I think, you know, he's, he's sensed the problem up front. Like Leclerc didn't just forget to break today. He had an absolutely legitimate problem. Uh, and you could see that snatching and the locking of the brakes. I, I don't know, Matt. It just looked to me like like an unlucky, it's like a brake failure, a glazing. Something was just grabbing on that brake disc. Yeah, he reported after the race, there was a hundred degree difference between his two front brakes. And that's enough to cause you real issues when you when you stamp on that pedal. So yeah, because Sainz was absolutely right. He knew there was a problem and he got around Leclerc as quickly as he could in order to minimize his losses. And let's also consider if we're gonna talk about things that might have been different, we might have been on a track that wasn't extremely rear limited with very high degradation, which is basically kryptonite to your average Ferrari. And despite that, Sainz, who arguably isn't necessarily the quickest driver all the time, was only three seconds back of Perez and almost within a pit stop of Verstappen, who might have been coasting some. But I don't think he was coasting all that much because I think he was having a lot of fun just driving the car fast. So I know a glazed disc can just sort of happen to everyone, right? Um, but it did just feel a little bit like, oh God, here we go again. Like the 2023, the 2022 all over again, where they have some sort of issue. We are checking 10 minutes later, mm. they potentially come up with some sort of thing as well. And it happened with science as well. When there's like, oh, when are, when are Checo's tires going to go off? And like, oh, real soon, real, real soon. <laughs> it was like Mexico last year. Oh, the, any moment now, any moment now. Relax, Carlos, relax. <laughs> it, it'll be fine. Yeah, well, you know, they had that argument. Oh, should we go on to the hards for the last stint? And Ferrari's like, well, we're much better on the hard tires. And besides all our calculations show that like 10 laps from the end, anyone who goes on the soft will start losing time. And you could see him like start to push. When he got that word, he was like, oh, right about now, you should be better. And then after a couple of laps, it was just like right back because he knew he wasn't going to catch Perez. But he did have the pace of Perez. And that is far better this season for Ferrari than oh, last season. I think Ferrari looks good. I think Ferrari looks like a genuinely improved car. And sorry, Carlos Sainz fans, I think Charles Leclerc's a better driver. So we... Ah, oh, come on. He's faster. He's better over a race in general. Really? So, yeah, what, really. Where is the evidence from the last three years that they've been teammates that suggests that Charles across an entire season is better than Carlos? Well, I would point out race pace. So I would say general race pace throughout a stint, you know, when and the times when you go, you have to push, the times when there's tyre drop off. Whenever I look at them side by side on the, you know, on the lap times, on the live timing, I always get the impression I would pick Charles Leclerc. So today, if you want to look at, well, what was the real pace of the car, I would have wanted to see Charles Leclerc without a problem, starting from second place on the grid, pushing and, you know, being able to drive off rather than Carlos Sainz, who I'd say is not as fast, my opinion. Oh, having, the one lap I agree with you. Having to fight through the grid first 
and then finally get to the Red Bulls after that battle and having sort of nothing left. So I don't think we saw the full Ferrari performance is my hope. I, but you don't need to wait for Carlos to get through the pack. You just need to wait for Charles to fling it into the scenery. Yeah, no, he does do that a bit. That's does do that a bit. On a Friday as well. <laughs> no, he's on Friday. Look, when, you know, the, the criticism of Charles Leclerc is that he's, he's incomplete. And I, you can, I can see that. Maybe Carlos Sainz is closer to peak Carlos Sainz than Charles Leclerc is to peak Carlos, uh, Charles Leclerc. But I just think if you're talking about let's see how good that Ferrari is, then we wanted to see Leclerc today without that problem. That's a really good point. I do agree with you that Carlos is, he is at, he's been he's digging Carlos. away, hasn't he? And been building up on, on himself. And is definitely a far better driver than he was, say, like when he was at McLaren, uh, for example. But with Charles, you always get the sense that there's, there's just something, there's something missing and that he's got more in the tank. And that if he was in a scenario where he needed to dig it out, he could dig it out. Yeah, you could say that Charles is uh, still learning, I would say. But he's been in the sport what? long enough. I think he, he should have... Uh... Are, you, are you trying to provoke me? You're trying to provoke me, right? Okay. No, uh, no okay. So that, that takes... Ian extra... Stroller is still in nursery school. If you're going exactly. pro to provoke me on air, then I have to say why. And by the way, that tweet <laughs> that tweet got about 6,000 likes. So, he'd, so you know it's good. A TV presenter said it's good that Alonso is Aston Martin because Lance Stroll has someone to learn from. And I got very, very triggered because Lance Stroll made his debut in 2017. This is his eighth season. He ain't learning nothing. This is this is Lance Stroll. This is as far as he's as he's going. And that was Catman trying to trigger me. But luckily, it worked. Didn't work because I'm easy breezy. Yeah, exactly. But the, the point I was making is that you were saying about how Leclerc is, is incomplete. Well, how much more time does he yeah, need no, to No, 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 that's a fair point. That is, that's a fair point. Uh, well, I just did a quick bit of looking and roughly he lost a quarter second a lap to signs. And usually you expect him to be about that much quicker. So, so the, the issue he had definitely cost him. And if he was that, that quarter second quicker, he would have been well ahead of Perez and not that far off of Verstappen because Perez was inside a pit stop on Verstappen at the end of the race. So my feeling is then that at the moment, Ferrari have come out of the blocks, you know, sec second best, but there was some error. There was some issue. Something about the way the brakes were put together didn't quite work out. To me, that feels like a freak incident or he's glazed it on the way to the grid or something like that so let, let's see what the ferraris can do over the next two races and something to remember as well is that these first three tracks they're all very different to each other so this is rear limited high wear and then we're going to saudi arabia with all the you know the flip-flops of death through the walls so you need a bit more bit more downforcey type track i don't know more more front limited perhaps and then we've got what? a street circuit in adelaide well, the thing about uh, Jeddah as well is that because it's got all those long straights as well, so you need the downforce, but you need the skinny wings to help with that as well. And then, uh, yeah, Melbourne, completely different circuit. Suzuka, that's all about high downforce, right? Yeah. So oh, yeah, yeah, a yeah, bunch yeah. of these different, like the first third of the season is just on very different uh, types of tracks. Okay, and it was quite cool in Bahrain, which is odd, because mm. it was a bit earlier, I guess. Yeah, it, it was a couple of weeks earlier, but they've also had some real like freak weather there lately. I mean, like right before testing, there was the huge rainstorms and things were flooded and everything. So, yeah, slightly odd oh, weather. Okay. First thing the TV talked about in FP1, which shocked me, was that the sand is glued down around the circuit to stop it ingressing onto the track. They go yeah. around and they spray the sand to glue it down. But don't worry. We're having sustainable fuels in a couple of years that no one else will be able to use or is a solution to mass transit. Um, all that eco... But let's glue sand down around... Join. I, I, once I heard that, I, I took all my recycling and I put it all in the black bin. I, I'm not taking it anymore. Um, so, yeah, oh. three very different three very different circuits um, coming up. Uh, but there'll be more heat in Saudi Arabia. Sure, Saudi Arabia will be hotter. Australia is very hot as well. And I think that we're going to have to see more compromises between uh, performance and and cooling. Also, I just realized I said Adelaide, I think. Oh, what did I you? Mean, <laughs> Melbourne, obviously. Well, I mean, you know, everything in Australia is so close together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Thanks. 
Thanks, there you go. chat. <laughs> oh, maybe that is you showing a bit of age as well. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, Albert Park, isn't it? Albert Park. So that's probably what I was trying to say. Albert Park and it there came we go. out early. Do you know what I had very recently in my head? Because we, we were talking about Monaco, and then for some reason the word Monte Carlo came into my head, and I didn't have the confidence that that was the place that Monaco was at. <laughs> And I stuttered and and ermed and erred, and I just went for it. And I go, okay, no, 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 it it was right. Okay, so uh, that brings us down. Talking of cooling, that brings us down the grid to Mercedes. 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 That that's a meme. That wasn't just bad mic technique. I was referencing a modern thing from about three months ago. I'm right on the cutting edge. Mercedes, very disappointing. I'm a Lewis Hamilton fan, ergo Mercedes fan, soon to convert to being a lifelong Ferrari fan, and I was disappointed. Who wants to talk about the disappointment and why I'm disappointed? Matt? Uh, I would love to, because first of all, if I'm Lewis Hamilton, I am no longer regretting my decision. Yeah, at least he knows he's not giving up a championship winning car. And apparently, Chris, it's me that said Adelaide, not you. So you you don't even have oh, to. Oh, I'm off the hook. Yeah, okay. you're off the well, hook. Well, rewind the tape. I could have sworn and I And can said I just it, say, but, uh... if you're going to comment on every time I get something wrong, you can. I don't mind. It's just going to take up a lot of your time. I'm thinking about you. Let's save you time. Feedback at mistapex.net, though, if you ever want to have you know, an email completely ignored. In episode 42, you said that the Australian Grand Prix was... Whoops, delete, delete, delete. Okay, so enough of my... I don't want to go into the story of why I'm getting a lot of spam email at the moment, because we'd said that on the Patreon pod. That was quite funny. <laughs> if you want to go and listen to the Patreon pod, which we're trying to record, you know, on a Friday, non-time sensitive... So a little bit of extra content, some non-F1 stuff as well. There was some funny stuff in it, this one. Patreon.com forward slash Missed Apex. And I finally expressed a political opinion as well. So I'm going to lose some patrons. So I need, I need more to, to top up on the rest of it. Mercedes really disappointing, Matt. And, and it just feels like it's not one thing. It, there was like a dozen things you could point to and go, man, they really, they just got, I think got inside their own heads maybe. Yeah, well, they've always loved to run right close to the ragged edge uh, with their cooling. Oh, and it became, yeah. it, early on, it became apparent that Russell was overheating his engine and it was an issue he had to manage. And then on top of that, for Hamilton, at one point, his battery was down to 1%. Like the recharge wasn't working. And so they had to go through and try and manage that as well after the race. Wolf uh, calculated that easily cost him a half a second a lap, which is well, you know, well, well, 25, well, well, 30 seconds. Is that what yeah. you're saying? He reckons the cooling itself costs half a second a lap? Yeah, well, the, the issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Roughly. Well, I mean, that this is the thing. That would have, they were more or less a, 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 around the same pace as McLaren. Like it was a fair fight with McLaren yeah. today, but I did feel like McLaren were operating well and Mercedes were operating disastrously. So, I mean, half a second at least would have put them clear of, of, of McLaren. Chris? So, they have a better balance with the car. That, I think, across the board, it feels better than last year's car. Okay? Good start. But, <laughs> but they've overheated the engine. They drained the battery on Lewis's car in the oh, first Oh, that's a five howler. Lives. That's an absolute Huge howler. Mismanagement there. Uh, his seat was broken. George was leaking fluids all over the place, apparently. Uh, it just seems like suddenly all these fundamentals have fallen apart. And you're right, this is not a, a Mercedes that's operating at 100% uh, at the moment. Which, it's not even close. Okay, based on, yeah, today's uh, performance is disappointing, but in a way, it does yeah. mean there's, there's room yeah. for improvement. I think, I, think, closer. I think I tweeted that was the good news is they've, they've done terribly this weekend so like yeah. so you can point to loads of things so firstly uh, you would generally say hamilton has had the the higher race pace the higher stint pace so russell up front going backwards might not be representative so he was p2 and then he lost out to perez and signs I mean, that might not be even his pace because they were struggling with the the cooling mismatch yeah. hamilton should have been up there supporting that fight up front, found himself in P9 through his own errors. So he admitted going to a more race-centric setup was the way he was trying to go. But also, it seems like they faffed a lot on the... So they did Friday, looked amazing. They were all happy. 
then they did P oh, sorry Thursday then they did P3 on Friday and then they all looked sad so what did they do what did they do to that car I think maybe we just have a rule if they're smiling and happy on a Friday leave the car alone have an internal park for me because they they definitely seem to have stuffed it between those two sessions uh, they're just not used to having a car that actually works the way it's supposed they to. Assumed. So they overcorrected for a problem mm. they no longer had, maybe. Shadow and, boxing. Yeah. And, and you know, for Russell, he absolutely was struggling. At one point with the overheating, he was doing so much lift and coasting that he was starting to lose. And this is the way the power unit feeds on itself. He was starting to lose battery, too. Like he wasn't getting enough recharge because he was doing so much lift oh, and coasting yeah. to manage the power unit temp temperatures but then your internal combustion engine has to work harder to make that back up so it becomes this really ugly spiral i'm actually impressed they were able to finish it but again if you give them the 25 or 30 seconds if, if we take wolf at his word both mercedes drivers finish ahead of perez if you take 30 seconds off their uh, off their end time and and lewis can't afford these poor qualifying performances no. anymore no 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 they, it, yeah it's too important now but but also it wasn't just that setup choice it was he, he also had a poor qualifying run as well so he yeah, was exactly. actually he was pouring q1 and then was pouring q3 as well so he made key mistakes that cost him at least three tenths by by most measures so mm. as a lewis hamilton fan i've stopped kind of looking forward to qualifying you know i've really seen it as a as a not a good day for lewis hamilton and i'm I'm just hoping that this is not the end of you know his general quality pace because he's unlikely to be improving into his 40s but it's bizarre qualifying was one of lewis's key strengths i he never i never i never I, and i used to get mocked for it. i've never thought of lewis hamilton's qualifying as his one of his key strengths it's always been his time management and race pace. And whenever I've said that, that people well. people go, uh, excuse me, he's statistically the greatest qualifier of all time. And you go, yeah, that's kind of true. But look, look, but Bottas could take it to him on a Saturday. Rosberg had the measure of him on, on a Saturday. So, you know, how, how can you say Hamilton's one of the best qualifiers ever when he's been, you know, you know soundly challenged? And now Russell's looking very competitive to him on a Saturday. Catman. Yeah, as you say, Mr. Saturday does all right. But Rosberg's 2015 pole position trophy, as you rightly said, I think <laughs> speaks volumes. Yeah. I think Hamilton was able throughout his career with his teammates to be able to go, well, I don't have to best you on a Saturday because yeah. I can just come through you on a Sunday, whether that's through superior time management, superior overtaking skill, whatever it is, he's been able to go through it. Yes, he's the statistically most, the best qualifier because he's got the most polls ever. Part of that will be his position that he's been in and being able to beat teammates on occasion. But I, I do think that it's not one of his major strengths and there are other things uh, that that are strings to his bow. And to me, this is where things get really interesting. Not talking about qualifying, but if we're looking at teams that had trouble, that also had Mercedes power units, we're talking about Mercedes, and we're talking about Williams. Yeah, they had issues. Williams being yeah. run by someone who came from Mercedes. And this is Val's first real car, because he sort of inherited the car he had last season. And they both have strikingly similar problems, not just with the cooling, but also with the electrics, which may be, you know, overheating related or not. I just, it makes you wonder a little bit. No, d definitely. I agree with you that the amount of times we talked about Mercedes and cooling and, you know, hacking bits of, you know, suddenly realizing there's not enough cooling on certain days and like hacking holes into the, into the bodywork. So yeah, I, th I think there's always been a bit of a blind spot for, for cooling at Mercedes. And we'll see because you can't just magic cooling. You can't, you know, you've got to let more air in and more air in isn't doing aerodynamic work. It's it's slowing the, the car drag. down. It's, it's drag. It's taking away from that cooling. So it's not necessarily that you will be able to magically do more cooling, crank the engine up and, and it all works out. But I suppose you would rather have more power and more drag at the same top speed, if you like. So, you know, they, they said they've miscalculated the cooling. Take them at their word. See if See if they can shake that off and then see if Lewis Hamilton can produce good Q3 laps consistently going forward. Let's see if they can bolt his seat down. Uh, the not recharging the battery is a concern. That really feels like a, almost like a brake magic type thing. So 
I, who's done the W13 on iRacing? I'm, I'm, I'm basing all my battery recharge, regen knowledge on that. But you can basically choose a neutral battery, or you can choose to deploy the battery, drain it, so you're getting more power, or you can put it on a mode where you're recovering more. Um, so for them to let it drain all the way down to 1%, it is, it is my sort of back of a fag packet non-knowledge that it would take, you know, four or five laps maybe to, to recharge it all the way. So... I think on a real F1 car, there are a few more options <laughs> no, than just, no, just high, three. neutral, <laughs> low. <laughs> yeah, there might be like eight <laughs> modes, but you know, you know what I mean? That's the general thing. That's that's the you yes. know the takeaway. In so. principle, yeah. yes, that is the very f- basic way of of how it works. So obviously, they've left it in a in a in a high deployment mode for too long when they should have cranked it down quite a bit sooner. Clearly, someone wasn't uh, checking checking the dials there. And saying, "Oh, Lewis is still in the high deployment uh, thing." We we should have told him to do that half a lap ago. I think it's very interesting how a number of these issues have only come to light in the race session because Mercedes, with their cooling issues, you know, throughout the test were fine with that. Same with Ferrari and their brake issues. I don't think the track was in a significantly different state. No, do you know what it is, Catman? No, I think I think they went, actually, it's cooler. We've got too much cooling. So let's, you know, let's take some of it off. But look, there's just a bunch of stuff, Matt, where there's low-hanging fruit. I yeah. I get the suspicion that if they were to get that together, it's going to be really close because I don't think Ferrari showed everything they had today as well. So I, I think Mercedes and Ferrari have both got more to show. But if I was going to, if I was going to guess... I actually think they're pr- they're pretty close, and that's based on Ferrari being better than I thought they were going to be. And if we were going to throw an extra one in there as well, just for the sake of it, I know McLaren were a bit better than kind of we were expecting after testing. Yes, agree. But this is not a track that would suit the McLaren, really. Remember last season, it was all about the high-speed corners. Maybe Jeddah in next week is going to be a bit more them and maybe they'll enter the fray a yeah. bit more as well really really optimistic about mclaren and it was um interesting mm-hmm. interesting watching them <laughs> so on we, it, you thought us it's high wear it's probably not going to suit them as much but it wasn't as high wear today so i think that might be a reason why this track wasn't suiting them you know in general so today it was a bit more forgiving on the wear and you can sort of gauge that by the gap between Piastri and Nor- Norris. So Norris was pretty much keeping up through the stint. But when Hamilton went on a charge, uh, Piastri had no defence, whereas Norris had defence and was able to to match it. I, I think that moment when Piastri was coming out of um, pit lane and he, he went wide, I think Oscar showed a, a, a rare bit of inexperience there where... I don't know. He was. It was almost like he wasn't seeing the bigger picture, and it was just like I need to keep Lewis behind <laughs> this corner, whatever it costs, and ends up, you know, overshooting the corner when, you know, maybe maybe a Norris would have sat back and gone, okay, well, I know there's a straight coming up. I'm, I'm going to have cold tires, mm. but maybe slipstream with a bit of DRS, I could just hang on to the back. But of then him. Piastri did drop off through that whole stint as well, Catman. Well. Yeah, I think once he'd lost that position, as you say, through maybe a bit of inexperience at that first corner, he did drop off now whether that was because there was no one behind him he wasn't oh, able yeah. to keep up with the mercedes and he went well there's no need for me to push the car so hard that i cause it to overheat or whether that is just because again piastri's achilles heel of an increased tire wear started to rear its ugly head again and he wasn't able to keep up with norris's pace as you said once norris was put under pressure he was able to step up mm. that pace to meet it so whether norris again it all of the guys are managing their pace to what they can do and to the pressure that they're under. So uh, I think that Norris still has something in hand over Piastri and it's going to take a little while for him to gain up to Norris's level. Mm. But I think I think uh, that Piastri has some way to go yet. So, yeah, M- McLaren definitely better than I thought they would be, especially on this track. The conditions probably less punishing in the specific way they struggle, they, they tend to suffer. But you're a McLaren fan. Oh, you've got a little, is that a Lego McLaren in the background? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. I love that thing. That is part of me that really wants to build a Lego McLaren. They do have a uh, Lewis version, the black Mercedes one now. So just so you know. Oh, no, that's going to be so expensive though, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) How much? They're they're about about 200 quid for for the... the... Blimey, they look lovely They're about as much as like an actual model. Yeah, but... 
you know. But to be quality. fair, it was really fun to make that thing. So you know, do it with your with your boy. I bet he'd love it. Hmm. Nah. Uh, uh, anyone who watched the pre-stream knows why I'm not buying him any presents. <laughs> um, that's why you got to tune in early, kids. So the, they are, though, without doubt, definitely fourth. Like m- minimum. They're minimum fourth. They're operating really well. And Norris was driving out of his skin today. So if you're a McLaren fan, which you are, Cadman, you've got a lot to be positive about. Absolutely. Although you say minimum, I think, well, certainly maximum because Aston Martin are in a field of their own a bit further back. So they've got a way to drop if they, they're they safe behind is what I mean. So they can afford to do different things to be able to move up. And as Chris said, Bahrain is not one of their classically strong tracks. So hopefully we'll see a lot more from them. But as I say, I do think that they were pushing the boundaries of what they could do today. Hopefully there's some more development in that car that they can unlock like they did last year. But it's a better start than last year, certainly, because they were right at the back. Let's not forget in 2023 at Bahrain. And by the end, they were right at the front. So let's see. I was going to say, like, this is so much better than the start of the season they've had yeah. for the last, like, four years, you know? So this is probably... a a positive in the long yeah, run. Yeah, no, no. People thought I was being neg. People saying, why are you being so negative about McLaren? And I genuinely didn't think I was. So without all the hype of whatever it takes and we're easy, we're going to be a clear P2, I would have been super enthusiastic going, they, they have, I think they've got fourth place in, in the bag this season, the way they've been developing. I really was only against the unrealistic expectations. And Tim has just posted a link to that Mercedes Lego car. Not a paid advert, not a paid sponsorship. Uh, 189 quid. Why I, I can't afford that until a, another team, except for Verstappen, wins a race and we maybe get a bump in, in downloads. Unless, Spanners, you put it on your tax deductibles and build it on camera. As or- content. As content, maybe, yeah. or maybe some of you will be interested in buying some Mist Apex merch. And uh, we haven't got it demonstrated on the YouTube today, but go and have a look at the, the clicks. Uh, click the show notes below. I've got a few items picked out there, but you can look at all of them. We have a, a wrong but first range. We have a work hard, be kind, have fun, a Matt 2 rumpet, and just some Mist Apex branded t-shirts and hoodies. And we've received them, and the quality seems decent. It's worldwide. I think most it most orders will be about eight ninety nine delivery. It's made to order, so it's it's about a tenner more than I would want the prices to be. To be honest, in an ideal world, I would I would get a stock of them and individually sell them out. But then inevitably, I'd have loads lying around. Uh, so they're the lowest price we could make them. Uh, there's not really any profit on them. But if you want some Mist Apex merch, I'm pretty proud of the wrong but first. I I think that's that probably the best one. It looks pretty sweet, Spanners, and I'm yet to receive mine in the mail, which is surprising. All right, hint. Dagger look. <laughs> hint, hint taken. Um, so uh, the reason that M- McLaren are a, a clear fourth, Matt, I think, as well, is partly down to if you look behind, over your shoulders, it seems to be a clear four now. There's a, there's a big gap going back. Uh, yeah, it is, and uh, I like that that Catman has brought up. Uh, the development race, because one thing that's going to be very challenging is what development ceiling do all these various concepts have, both from a concept point of view, but also from a resource point of view. And one thing McLaren did excellently is they made us all believe that they they were really happy with where they were. And then they convinced us that they were going to be nowhere because they didn't get everything delivered on time. And then they showed up today and did this. So I no longer believe McLaren. McLaren are playing some kind of weird poker game with their fans, making sure that everybody's happy with whatever they see on track. <laughs> no, there no, is that, scope. That's the Zach Brown. Yeah. That's the Zach Brown thing. By the way, shipping merch is uh, worldwide. Uh, Maria was asking, but that's the Zach Brown thing. Zach Brown is really carefully managing. You know, getting everybody really excited, getting Lando Norris to sign the contract, making sure his sponsors are happy. And then it's a bit of a bait and switch because they definitely, definitely promised P2. Whatever it takes, they promised it. And now they're kind of being, oh, no, this is really great progress. P4, huh, guys? P4, look at that. 
they never said when they would achieve P2. They, they've, <laughs> they've said, we'll get P2 definitely at some point. Uh, Zach Brown's now saying second half of the season. He's saying, look out, second half of the season. We're going to be really poor, second half. Yeah. Is this going to be like the, the Alpine five-year plan? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. no, no, well, no. Except for the they season. delivered last season on that. Now, didn't they? Yeah, McLaren have absolutely been punching above their weight. They've been doing great. It's, it's expectation management for me, but Zach Brown isn't worried about our expectation, really. He's worried about the driver signing a contract. He's worried about Google signing on and staying on as a sponsor. It's that, it's that kind of game that he's playing. And he, to be fair, he's probably the best in the business, pound for pound, uh, from, yeah. from the teams. I read a thing. I was doing some research for a job, and I read that uh, on Sports Business Journal, I think it was reported, yeah. that under Zach Brown's leadership, McLaren's uh, sponsorship intake has quadrupled. Wow. And that... I think tells you everything you need to know because I think there are more stickers on that car than there are any other on the grid. Yeah, have they have they not got the revolving sponsorship panel this year? I don't. They do. They think, do. No, yeah. are they actually racing yeah. it though? Yeah. Because it, it's quite heavy. Yeah, it was on the right hand side it, on the cockpit. It's kind of it's still there, I think, and it's no, it's uh, not that yeah. heavy. It's yeah, heavier but, than a sticker. That is very true. But yeah, if you think back to when Alonso was in that car, they had the the McLaren flashes on the side pods because they had no sponsors. Yeah. Zach Brown comes in, gets the papaya back, gets sponsors on board, gets the Google Chrome wheels, all these sorts of things. That's it's, the it's biggest. Genius. That's the biggest one he's pulled is convincing everyone that papaya was some like major thing that we're all meant to get excited <laughs> about. I'm really old, and papaya means nothing to me. And they just they, they they told you. Do you remember you like papaya? Everyone oh, papaya. But and the thing is, now it is something to remember. Now it is the classic modern McLaren color. Yeah, I and like this it. is and this is why Red Bull are so good at marketing because their car has been the same for about ten years at least with minor changes. But I mean, this year to last year, literally no changes whatsoever in livery because they've built a brand. Zach Brown is building a papaya or mango or whatever you want to call it brand. Am I the only one that's upset that Red Bull aren't red? I've thought about this. Mm. Why is their primary colour blue? Yeah, and they should be blue, guess, blue bull. But I guess the bulls themselves on the logo are red. Is it? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. No. Yeah. The bull that. is red, I but the background is blue. Well, I wish I'd thought that through more before saying it. Don't just say everything <laughs> you think. Stop it. Stop. You've immortalized it now, Spanners, on the internet. I'm just trying to delay talking about some of the teams that we're less enthusiastic about. So, no, no, Matt wants to stay. I, I want to finish on um, two other things to look for. Just broader, I mean, not just McLaren, but McLaren specifically because we're going to Saudi Arabia, where they've been very good, very, very good at the high-speed turn. It's going to be difficult to just say, oh, here's the best team, here's the second best team. It's going to change a lot over the season. And I think that is really something to look forward to, especially as developments come on and some teams reach their resource limit and can't go further. It's it's going to be a fascinating season. Okay, regardless. well, uh, sadly, uh, depending if you're not neutral or not, Red Bull, probably top, top, top for development. Uh, Mercedes, excellent at development. Red uh, Ferrari, traditionally not as strong as those two. So at this point, you know, I think if you want to do the finishing order, I think the finishing order at this point is going to end up being Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, from what we can see. McLaren, I think, are going to be untouched because look who's behind McLaren is Aston Martin. Aston Martin and Alpine last season. Alpine are just gone. I don't know if we want to do a separate show. I mean, who do we talk about at Alpine? I don't want to mention any names because they'll have re resigned tomorrow and then we have to re-record the show with different names. So you just have to call <laughs> them all Derek. It's a disaster. Alpine's a disaster. People are saying, saying to me, oh, I'm way too harsh on Alpine. Uh, no, I'm not. Catman, look what's going on there. If anything, I've, I've held back. Yeah, I'm going to double down on my preseason prediction that oh, Alpine yes. will not be Alpine in 2025. They're going to be gone and probably have sold to Andretti. And that would on their current performance be saving face to be honest with you because the parent company Renault is not going to put up with this level of performance they've been slipping backwards they've been firing people left right and center because they were slipping down from fourth to sixth place if they are going to finish in 10th far off the back of the field because they've got reliability issues they've got pace issues their drivers are good but they can only do so much to bring them up the field I mean 
Haas did a much better job today, and we were expecting them to be yeah. miles behind. So Alpine today only beat Bottas, who was in the pits for a year, and uh, was Sergeant, Sergeant, who ended up in the runoff area for uh, like a lap and a half, right? So, yeah. so what does the Alpine do well? Not much. It doesn't look great because they've had to shave off every bit of paint on it to to keep it somewhere near the weight limit. Yeah, but what, what about the bits? Over. What about the bits that are painted though? Those bits are quite nice. Oh no, the few bits not. that Is are painted. Just, okay. The drivers are pretty good. That's good. Um, no, and apparently uh, t- today as well, so Racing News 365 uh, reported today as well that their head of aero and the technical director yeah, yeah, resigned as well. So hard to find some positives. And you know me, Span, as I said at the top of the show, I'm an optimist. Uh, so five years from now, uh, they'll be winning the championship. I five you. years from now. And, and, and bless Ocon, Matt. You know, they're like a sympathetic spouse, like at the after qualifying. No, no, you, you did fine. And you've been under a lot of pressure. I still love you. Yeah. Yeah. No, the um, the interesting thing to me about Alpine. Well, first of all, let's back up a little bit. Uh, the departures that Chris was discussing are very monumental because mm. you can see a lot of De Beers and Harmon's handiwork up and down the grid. They have been regularly the first to put things on their card that other teams steal. And I'm not just talking teams behind them, I'm talking teams ahead of them too. And they've done it again for this season. They completely reworked the internal cooling. It looks very much like they could have side pods similar to the front running teams, but they don't. And that is because the theory is They had trouble with the chassis they chose to build with the crash tests. And either they ran out of money to build the rest of the car they intended to, or they ran out of time to. And I'm hoping they can build the rest of that car just so we can see (laughs) where they get to. But yeah, but yeah, it's, it's an utter disaster. They got rid of their team principal and they're an Alan Permain, you know, Safnauer and Permain gone middle of last season. Very unusual for that to happen. And all of this is really the result of larger squabbling between parent Renault corporate politics and Alpine road car politics. And it's all filtering down to the Formula One team. And it's just, all I can say is we'll have lots of really great stories once they can start talking. That's longer than I wanted to speak about Alpine about. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, Aston Martin were disappointing and disappointed. I wanted... I I went from... The vibe, Chris, I went from pre in the testing was that one interview, I think it was Ted Gravitz, asking them could they make the podium. And Alonso couldn't answer no quickly enough. Almost, <laughs> almost before the question was asked. Do you know not realistic and i love when they ask stroll have you got a better car than last year and he just paused for so long and it was very clear they were unhappy and and it's unfolding and i can't think of any mitigating circumstances either they are just well off the pace yeah um i i think we know that the development of the car last year was a bit of a struggle uh and it seems like that has continued into the development of this new car so they're definitely not starting off on the same strong foot uh since uh i mean well we, we know since the technical directive wink wink uh from <laughs> last know. season right? nudge, nudge. Uh, but it's but what what i don't quite understand specifically about aston martin's race uh today is how fernando alonso ended up in a position where after his final pit stop he was behind lance stroll who was facing the wrong way at, at turn one oh. yes stroll got in really early on the stops and had mad undercut but he was facing the wrong way at turn one that was the never should have been no nearing. matt wants to get in i want to know if i'm clever enough to know did he run did they no, run too ahead. long did they run too long and so he basically overcutted himself well essentially that's what happened so let's go back to the incident and oh. let's go back to the fact wait, wait, that wait, hang on which incident matt 
The only one? <laughs> the turn one incident. But, the only one that happened during the race. Strollin' Hulkenberg? Strollin' Hulkenberg. But whose fault was it? Whose fault is it? Yay, we get to play the game. Straight away. And this was like the only incident of the race, wasn't it? It was a, yeah. it was a bizarre little incident. I feel like Hulkenberg had seven or eight chances to not drive into the back of Lance Stroll and then decided, yeet. The shortest game of uh, who's <laughs> fault is it we're ever going to play. <laughs> no, but it's weird. It's not. It's not like everything suddenly like something went wrong in front of him. He he started stopping and then he stopped stopping and then just hit him. He like he could, he. I think feels like he easily could have stopped. Yeah, yeah, it did. It's, it was like uh, he just lobby didn't. stuff. Catman, go on. Oh no, Matt, 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 Matt. Matt. Well, you know, someone has to blame someone besides the obvious person in this situation. And here I'm going to I'm going to put it out. I'm going to blame the FIA for letting the teams build SUVs instead of real race cars. The things are gigantic. They're far too wide. They're far too long. The drivers have a very difficult time. And oh, yeah, I know. Oh, they're a professional race. But they have a very hard time knowing exactly where the the outer corners of their car are from their seated position and so yeah i mean technically hulkenberg hit stroll so yeah, you got was, me there he was in his but, gearbox at that point he knew where the edge of his car was in stroll's gearbox yeah once he hit stroll he knew exactly where the end of his car was but it's it's not it's not reducing the incidents to have cars this big that's the point i'm making yeah, he's just uh, forgotten how long his nose is, I think, because as you say, he kind of starts braking, lets up a little bit and just goes, oh, there's the back of Stroll's car. I'll just nerf him off. Bless him, though. He was making up for a poor start. He probably thought this is the best grid position that Haas are going to have. Who mm. who rightly had Hulkenberg in Q3 no. before the start of the season, right? No. So, And then you see him just dump the clutch as, as he... Uh, as he lets go. Oh, is that what he did? Grid. Yeah, well, Stroll didn't start um, ahead of him. He uh, he had to, you know, kind of he kind of lost out on the grid there, and then was trying to make up for a a poor start. And then, yeah, unfortunately, he just got a little bit too eager on releasing that brake pedal to try and get a run, and just unfortunately just tapped the diffuser, and that was it. Which is just such a shame. But I, could, what, what, I don't even know what platform it was when I was talking about the two Haas drivers. And the thing they really have in common is they just mm. love getting stuck in there. Like there is no shorter life expectancy than a, a Haas front wing. That's the red shirt of F Formula One is the Haas <laughs> front wing end plates. So, but apart from that incident, he was quick in qualifying and he was quick on race pace here. And Magnussen, who wasn't quite as quick was still up in P12 holding off Visa cash grabs. So yeah. like where did that come from? Like we all wrote, we all wrote Haas off except for Mike Caulfield on the pre-race show and he was like no, there's good people there. They're playing down expectations. They're not as bad as it looks and it looks right so far. Catman. Yeah, he said that IO the new team principal was just as you said, managing expectations, mm. making sure no one got their hopes up because they've <laughs> got no money, they've got no power. <laughs> And yet they've got two great drivers who can stick it in places where they really shouldn't be. And it's it's fantastic that they're able to do that because it gives the field a little bit of a jumble because historically last year, it was a case if they could qualify well, but then just dropped off the order. But Magnuson showed today that actually they have got on top of their tire management issues and are able to keep that pace. As you said, they managed to keep a charging Ricardo on softer tires. Admittedly, he burned them up behind Sonoda, but he he keep, kept them behind for a couple of laps towards the end of the race, which is a, a very decent effort for that Haas team. Well, and let's not forget, uh, Ferrari, being a team from whom they buy many, many parts, has shown them the way last season. They took a car that was terrible on tire de degradation and was able, without significant development, to improve it. And then they show up with parts that do improve it. Komatsu said like i mean you, you said it on our testing review how's one testing they ran more laps than anyone they didn't run any fast laps and kamatsu basically said our only job here is to improve our race pace which means improving on the tires and they've absolutely done that and they didn't have to do a super lot of development to make that happen if they can develop successfully this season it's going to be very very interesting but i can't believe 
no one is making a bigger deal out of how good a race Lance Stroll had getting punted to 20th and finishing in the points. That is, I think, for a lot of people, annoyingly impressive. Chris, was your point related to what Matt was talking about at the beginning of when he started speaking or related to the thing that he ended up talking about, the completely the, the, different definitely subject? Definitely the beginning. Right, yeah. let's start at the beginning there. So Haas, and then we'll go back to <laughs> Aston Martin where we were. Well, just uh, improving the race pace is absolutely right because it seems like, okay, you know, this sort of strategy is as a result of the limitations of what their car was capable of. But the strategy was qualify P6 and desperately cling on to dear life for as long as possible (laughs) in the race and pray you end up in the the points by uh, the end of the race. And that's not a sustainable strategy. So improving the race pace is definitely the way to go. Well, I still think that Riza, Cash App, RB had race pace over them in the end. Uh, Possibly, maybe it it, they'd look tight. Uh, I mean, obviously there was a bit of mismanagement towards the end, uh, of course. But you know, Magnussen actually kind of made forward progress. Um, and and okay, yeah, Ricardo would he lost the best of the soft tires by the end of it. Uh, So I I still I still think um, Magnussen keeping him behind was impressive, but that car was definitely not as quick as kind of everyone had made it out to be after. Not just after testing, but after sort of uh, Thursday uh, practice, anyway. Yeah, I, I don't think that the cash grabs did have good pace over the house because, as you say, Sonoda was behind him. He was complaining very vociferously that he wasn't able to have an attack in the last couple of laps. And yes, he was close behind, but they were on a similar kind of strategy, similar tire degradation. And I, I don't think that Sonoda would have had any better chance of getting past he had his moment and and wasn't able to so they let ricardo go should they have given the swap those positions back that could be a debate but um yeah he, he never managed to, to have a go so i think has had it in hand don't worry we're coming back to that matt uh yeah j- just to finish up if we're going to talk race pace it has to be the whole race being faster at the end means that you were slower somewhere else and they might have had pace over the Haas a little bit at the end. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, But very clearly, they didn't have enough pace to make a pass. Yep. Okay, and uh, just a general point of order with uh, Visa Cash App RB is that their name is Visa Cash App RB. You don't get to sell the naming rights and then gently brief the media that you want to be called Recarb or RB. Nope. You took the money, your Visa Cash App RB. Okay, I'm harsh on Stroll, Matt. What's the point you were making? Uh, point is, he went from 20th to 10th in the race. Where did Alonso finish? Ninth. Okay, so finish behind his teammate, got it. His teammate who did not get put to the end of the race and didn't have to drive the whole race with damage to his diffuser. Yes. Don't you still have damage to the diffuser? Oh, okay. Well, How that's encouraging. Yeah. But I, I will also say that that's offset a little bit by Alonso was given quite poor tactics also so i think that going long on that last stint it was just it was pointless like why did he stay out so long he was just losing time hand over fist go on because zach brown is not the only person with investors he wants to keep happy oh, so and wanted- what looks better than alonzo having an extreme tire offset and passing a bunch of people that can't possibly hold him off I'm just, you know, I mean, they could have run him on the same strategy as everybody else in the top 10, and he would have passed, you know, may, maybe a couple of people on a pit stop, on his first pit stop, and that would have been it. But if you wait till the end of the race, give him super racy tires, not only is Alonzo happy, yay, I get to race some, <laughs> but then your investors at the end of the race suddenly, oh, Alonzo's catching up, Alonzo's passing this person, Alonzo's passing that, everybody wins in this scenario. Okay, but also, can we say Stroll being, you know, the further down you are, the more likely you are to get caught up in an instant. So Stroll, you know, was was down there of his own volition, wasn't he, because of the qualifying. So there you go. Yeah, he started in the carbon fibre zone, so you're going to expect to to be in that (laughs) uh, for a while. But, you know, Alonso was running long. Was he expecting a safety car? Because we quite often get something, you know, maybe if Sargent had 
managed to give up on his car and actually leave it parked that where he left so it. That was so disappointing. It was like, it, 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 when he started getting going, because Brundle was on the other uh, commentary I was watching, Martin Brundle is there going, that's a definite, 100%, definitely a safety car. You're like, yeah, that solves everything. That brings Max back. Hamilton's not punished so much. Everybody's back in the mix. Let's go again. And as he got going, you're like, no, come on. Yeah, so, absolutely. The difference between Alonso and Stroll when we're talking about how close the field is now and how important qualifying is Lance runs the risk of being found out even more <laughs> compared to last year if he's not making Q3 on a regular basis and starting in the carbon fiber zone and making his races a lot more difficult than they need uh, to be and uh, we we might see that disparity in the constructors championship result again and he doesn't have the broken wrist um excuse this year so i i think that the the drive to survive netflix aston martin episode next no. year is going to be a little oh, okay. bit trickier to sell what i don't understand is somehow that was his the races he ran with his broken wrist and his broken toe those those were his best races yeah like not just not just in terms of the results because they had a great car at the start of last year, but literally his driving, his overtaking, he, the distance between him and Alonso as well. That was genuinely his best performances. So I think he needs to go out back on the bicycle and just <laughs> no, no, that's terrible. Bumpy road somewhere. That's terrible advice. So, you know, I think I know what happened. Uh, yeah, my son he Lance, he needed to catch up. Alonso wanted more tires, and I said no, you don't get tires. Only my son gets tires. That I am honestly, I am zoning in. I think I've nearly got it, nearly exactly. It's uh, definitely better than it was last week. But that was a low bar. That's the, that's the closest <laughs> I've got. <laughs> Aww. Okay. Last, honestly, the last topic before I think before uh, the podium is just those team orders between the Visa Cash App RB drivers. I have gone down a little bit on my Snowda fandom today very very disappointed with uh with and i will call it this with the behavior chris mm. yeah i mean even daniel called it immaturity mm. uh after the race as well um well nick de Vries called sonoda immature and look what happened to de Vries. shipped off what's amazing is that even uh pg yuki sonoda um <laughs> was still able to <laughs> convey his displeasure um at the at the situation because you know yuki it's normally beep 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 ah, rang you, blah, 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 all this and then That's today it was yuki. much more uh restrained uh until the cool down lap that moment if you, if you okay. haven't seen it he sort of lunges for, yeah uh for daniel at, at, at turn eight and sort of yeah deliberately crowds him uh, well, it's more bit. than that. It's more than that, Matt. It's, he flung his car at him and then deliberately accelerated up the inside very, very close. And that is aggressively using your prototype sports car to make a specific and dangerous point. Like, it is dangerous. Even if you want to talk about danger to the the machine as well, I, I honestly hope, and I'm a Sonoda fan here, but I honestly hope that is looked at in the context of a race ban. Um, okay. I actually have a bit of a different take on it, which is having looked at the onboards from both drivers, I'm just going to go with basically Sunoda got caught out by Daniel lifting and not breaking, went inside, locked up, <laughs> no and when he way. came back on, what? Ricardo had left him no room. I mean, look, you are such a nice guy. That is the most generous I, I, interpretation. I just, I'm saying it's a possible interpretation of the events based on what I've seen. And since I haven't heard, I've heard from Ricardo, but we didn't really hear anything from Tsunoda. He's given us no explanation for why this has happened. So I'm just not going to jump to the same conclusions. That's fair. As everyone else. That's fair. And you are being a really nice human being. Let's speak to someone who's a complete turnip. Uh, Chris, Catman, set him straight. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't explain the corner exit behavior of the yes, dumping the throttle on the true. curb, nearly oversteering into Ricardo and then just charging off into the distance on the warm down lap. It's it was a hundred percent deliberate. He, he, he let me, let me, it down the inside, <laughs> all four wheels locked up. There's there's no way. No, no, I can answer for Matt. Matt's gonna say, no, he was just trying to show Ricardo the way back to the pit lane. Follow me, Danny. 
No, I, I will ask you a different question. If you, if you were racing an iRace and someone goes off behind you, do you expect them to potentially come back on the track? And if you don't want to have a collision, do you leave room for them? Not on the warm down lap, you know. Yeah. Do, do you know what, Matt? I think the one thing you're right about is let's wait to see what Sonoda says. But as a, as yeah. a fan, I expect more from the people I'm a fan of. Uh, really, I, I really completely get that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. It did look good. No doubting that. Christopher? So in uh, response to you saying looking at it with a race ban, um, two previous examples I can think of. And I, I think the uh, the only thing that will save Yuki from this was the fact that no actual contact was made between the two cars. So in an instance where we've seen this and there was contact was obviously the most famous case being Sebastian Vettel in uh, Baku against Lewis Hamilton. Show me where I did dangerous driving. driving. Yeah, show me where I did da dangerous driving. And they gave him the harshest penalty that wasn't a black flag which is the 10 second stop and go penalty. And then uh, in Monaco a few years ago, I think it was Pastor Maldonado uh, driving up alongside Perez and just sort of, yeah, jamming into him between uh, like uh, just before Portier. Um, and I can't remember. I think he got like a grid penalty for that. I want to say. Yeah. I mean, Maldonado did it like two or three times. He did it to he did Hamilton in Spa. <laughs> he, you know, everywhere. Oh, yeah. Look. Everywhere you look, Maldonado was revenge crashing into people. Uh, or he was crashing into himself because he was too busy looking at the dials on his oh, steering wheel. Man, I really want to look at a highlights reel of Maldonado. After the show, that's what I'm doing. Uh, it was China. He, yeah, he nearly crashed into the pit lane because he was just looking at the steering wheel. He, he was such a pantomime villain. It was wonderful. I, yeah, I want we want to need Maldonado. Matt, go on. Last one. Okay, well, can I just ask the question before you go then? We're talking a lot about the post-race incident, but we're not talking about the team orders that actually precipitated it. And here's what I've learned. First of all, that soft tire strategy for Ricardo at the end seemed to have been decided before the race. Second of all, and I'll just ask the question, with Ricardo making no progress, why didn't Yuki get the position back? Are we looking at Ricardo has been anointed mm. by Red Bull and Yuki... Uh, much like we've Sensitive. seen other drivers, is going to be in a real fight to retain uh, what we would consider to be fair rules of racing with your teammate. Okay. No, I, I, I see that. But I would say, why was he angry at Ricardo for that? Ricardo didn't make the decision. Ricardo did everything that the team instructed him to do. That's it. He asked to go past, didn't he? Wasn't that Ricardo's request? Yeah, because he's, he's a racing driver. So that's, that, that, that more or less explains that. All right, let's move on to our awards. A very typical Formula One race for me. And I'm sort of torn because I think without the bubble of being involved in, in social media or doing the shows, I wouldn't have been exposed to a lot of people finding it, it boring. So I don't want to be unsympathetic to if the race didn't tick the things that make you enjoy an F1 race. So I'm not going to gatekeep what it constitutes an enjoyable race for you. I just know that in my bubble, watching the live timings, as a season opener, as a first look-see, trying to tease out how everybody's doing, it was a, an interesting, it was a strategic race that lacked only a, an element of chaos. You know, there was no rain. There was no strange tyre condition. It wasn't a strange time of night. There wasn't a, a safety car. There wasn't that event, that big crash that you can you know, structure the show around. That's all that it was missing. This was a, a standard F1 race with some really good driving performances and we're, we're about to do the awards. But there were some standout performances, there were some poor performances and there was definitely a strategy element and we saw the first big, I think the first big surprise undercut of the day, for example. So yeah, seeing Hulkenberg on that pace, everyone went, no, the, the undercut's going to be huge, go. And that curtailed the strategy of anyone who was looking to go long that stopped any chance of a, a one-stop or, or of it turning into a, a boring one-stop. or What goal, Matt? What? It was never going to be a one-stop. It was going to be a two or a three. No, but you, you know what I mean? But it curtailed most people's options, yeah. apart from the Red Bull. So, the, okay, the nearest we had to a one-stop was going long and then going to the softs at the end. And it was only the Red Bulls who had that luxury. Everybody else was kind of forced into that uh, soft, medium, medium kind of, uh, kind of roll of the dice. Although, did Red Bull have 
softs to spare to have extra. Yeah, I think yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. They were the, yeah. I think they were the only ones who had like a, a set of softs to put on, and because mm. everyone else had saved the hearts, didn't they? Anyway, I'm just saying I had fun watching that race unfold. To me, that's a perfectly typical, perfectly normal Formula One race. If that's the kind of race where you go, that's ah, not for me. I do like the ones where it goes off, and uh, how, how can I enjoy that race more? I would the live timing to me so much of that race happened watching the live timing it was absolutely fascinating and it's things you don't see on on tv and it's a very easy way to quickly track battles going on in the in the midfield you know how's holkenberg recovering you know all, all of those things came to life and were apparent quickly and things like whose pace is dropping off uh, who can respond better than the other so when hamilton's uh, lap time started uh, you know being very competitive then you saw Piastri can't keep this up. Well, but Norris can. That's a surprise. That's telling us, you know, an awful lot. And you can really see the race unfold. The other tip, if especially if you're newer to F1, right? Practice watching F1. So on the practice sessions, practice watching it so that you know where the corners are coming up. You know when the overtakes are starting to happen, how likely it is there's going to be a move and stuff like that. Anyway, that's enough of Uncle Spanners around their F1 tree. It's time for our awards. And so the first award is, uh, what, what are we calling this one now? We're we calling it the Hit the Apex Award. It's Thing of the Weekend. It's the Thing of the Weekend. Oh, I know what I do. So we call it that. And then I go, hey, Matt, for you, who hit the apex? I absolutely love that. Ah, this yeah, is, yeah, this is This yeah. is so... Mm, mm. The thing for me is normally I'd really want to say, yeah, I think science is like just wrote himself into a new job, but I'm not. I'm going to go with a little known comment by Lando Norris talking about his race and saying that he felt that he'd have been faster around the final turn in a reliant Robin than in his McLaren, because apparently they had a real issue getting around the final turn. So the final quarter is just like a little 90 degree right hooker, isn't it? And it's a fairly early apex. So what was he struggling with there? Um, I don't know. It seemed to be sort of a very specific issue to both McLarens. And uh, both Aston Martins as well. I think Alonso was, was struggling getting, a, even early on, defending against Hamilton. That's where Hamilton got him in the end, I think. But uh, having seen a Reliant Robin going sideways down a driveway, it just made me <laughs> laugh in a way and entertained me. So congratulations, Lando. Hey, young people. You a thing. Reliant Robin is a three-wheeler van yeah. with a one wheel at the front, two at the back, made famous by the UK TV sitcom Only Fools and Horses. Um, there you go, Chris. I filled you in on that. I, I've seen Only Fools and Horses. Well, you're like 20. And the, ca the car was, of course, immortalized by Jeremy Clarkson rolling one of them 27 times on uh, Top Gear. Some Fair years enough. Ago. Chris. Who hit the apex for you? Well, it's so hard to pick anything out of uh, a bunch of people who very clearly missed the apex other than Red Bull. Uh, and even then, you'd only nail it down to Max. So I would have to go with Joe Guan Yu. Oh, hello. Because uh, that car seems to have made a bit of forward progress and they did a nice undercar early on in the race and it was nice to see a very good looking car it's so uh, good and looking th yeah and i don't remember the last time i saw joe Kuan Yu running inside the top 10 uh actually such was the performance of that car last year um so yeah that was nice i don't even remember where he finished in the end it wasn't in the points but um nice job hmm well Catman. He finished. It, like I say he finished in eleventh, just oh. one place ahead oh. of Kevin Magnussen, who would be my hit the apex award because of exactly the same thing, nice. because they both did a really good job with inferior machinery, besting the RBs who were, you know, destined to, for greatness apparently, but they they couldn't couldn't keep up. So I I would definitely go with those two as doing a great standout performance today. I do have a second. Um, slightly cheeky thing of the weekend or like uh, hit the apex thing and that is um, and you're going to hate me for this banners but it's Chris McCarthy for jumping into the F2 commentaries standing in for Alex Jakes because he was feeling unwell yeah it's not, uh, the, it's not like, the F2 it's not Mr. Apex F2 is it I don't, I don't care I just thought I'd give my boy a shout out interesting trivia I got two years of work from a karting series because Chris McCarthy uh, didn't turn up and got sacked and then they were that desperate for someone that they 
I'm sure he's more reliable now. This is like 2018. But anyway, I'm saying I've got loads of money out of that. So thanks, Chris. I'm a fan <laughs> just for that. Okay, so the, the Hit the Apex Award, for me, there's, there's, I've got three, and I'm going to go for the... It's the best car driver combinations for me. So obviously, Max Verstappen, for a lot of the reasons we've stated, operationally, they were great. He raced great on turn one, really brought that home without sweat. Well done. Carlos Sainz and Ferrari, his racing attitude, and obviously operationally, that car as well. It looks like they've put a great package together. Uh, but then, the, the, honestly, the one that I w- was most impressed with today was, was Lando Norris keeping that McLaren ahead of Lewis Hamilton towards the end of the stint. Uh, I think... That's where we're, we're going to see Lando Norris now looking as Lando Norrisy as possible. He's got a point to prove. He's on. He's on it. He's on point. The weakness will be the total car performance, but McLaren themselves seem to be functioning well, um, and that is a great driver car combination. I think uh, probably Charles Leclerc deserves a, a mention as well he for did. like dragging that uh, car I don't know. to the finish because it Maybe. like we it was a handful. To drive. Well, we don't clearly. know that. We don't know that the brake. He didn't glaze it himself. So it then doesn't matter. The I, don't, I don't think it matters. No. So I, I, I think it's worth a shot because he had to drag that thing around for. Oh, good. So I've messed whole... this up because at the end of last season we swapped it round, didn't we? So that we could end on the positives, and now we're ending on the negative. And uh, imagine well, we just end... go back for round two of this, and we'll be fine. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. See. But if we're ending here, it'd be, oh, haven't we been so nice about everyone? We're good sofa pundits. But no, instead, we're going to ask, who missed the apex? Oh, no, you missed the apex. Who hit the fire alarm for you? No, who missed the apex for you? Sorry, another pre-show reference there. Who missed the apex, Matt? I'm going to go with the Williams new steering wheel. Managed to mess up both oh. of their drivers in one fell swoop. Uh, the, the the dash display on the Williams, it just went, nah. It was just big letters, N-A-H, just like, nah. No, it was, just, it was so unhelpful, um, just like, meh. It's like when your phone, when you go to hit, when you hit your phone and like, it just, it just sits there on the same screen and does nothing. You're like, no, you're supposed to do the thing now. Poor Alvin, so, poor Sergeant. Just, so uh. this, this is their first season with a screen on the steering wheel rather yeah. than on the front of the car- cockpit that you could only see when the steering wheel's in the right orientation. <laughs> so they finally come up to the modern steering wheels and it looks like it's not not managed to to work quite right. Didn't they have to change sergeants as well? They did in, in the, the third pit stop. N- never shown, I don't think. Well, there you go. Williams, your steering wheels have missed the apex. Chris Stevens, who missed the apex for you? Well, it's got to be Mercedes, isn't it? It's like such unlived potential. It's so many. There was so many things. They didn't get one thing wrong. They got so many things wrong. And then the drivers probably underperformed as well. And I know Russell had a lot to deal with. But then when he finally had a chance to defend against Signs, you know, he he's goes off and sort of gives Signs a, a free pass. So you can't argue that Hamilton or Russell had a good weekend. You can't uh, say that the setup engineers had a, a good weekend. You can't. Total Wolf didn't have a good weekend because he kept, you know, he'd, he'd say what his engineers basically told him to say. So he, he, goes, he goes to the engineers and says, how are we looking? Why didn't we qualify well? Goes and says it to the press. And then the next time he has to come back going, yes, all of that was clearly rubbish. But, you know, I'm going to execute a few people and now we will come back next race and we'll definitely be good. I mean, he's going to terminate. A few no, people. you can't. That's lazy. You can't do the Arnie thing. You can't. I was trying to go a different direction creatively. All right, Catman, who missed the apex for you? Well, uh, apart from literally Charles Leclerc missing the apex at turn Every 10. Every turn, most, yeah. Most of the race. Um, I was going to go with George Russell specifically from Mercedes, not only for uh, letting Leclerc through with a lazy error, but Sorry, also I was for... It was uh, it was Leclerc towards the end. Oh, okay. It? It but anyway, um, also I was going to say because of his introductory video on you know when the music's on and you're just getting revved up and last year he was all the like this yeah. you know with his arms stretched pose. out to the side yeah and he was promising over the winter that they were going to do something he'd put out a couple of Instagrams that, you know, going like, what should I do? Should I do this, this, this? And then it was really boring. He was just walking towards the camera. So that's my 
missed apex of the he game. got so much grief for the sticking the arms out pose that he just he had to play it safe you know he just needed a good solid intro pose performance and and that's what you had to do and he did a really big good bit of comment um, social media he went around all the pit crew and was asking them what their poses would be so actually russell has done quite a quite a load of pre-season social media stuff that's been really fun um and he's taken that in good humor but he's clearly got a lot of stick for that intro post from from last season now so who's going to miss the apex uh, for me uh, you've left the low-hanging fruit alpine that has got to be the biggest year-on-year -year depreciation they are they are definitely lots of people jumping ship it seems to me like there is no short-term recovery and they are wasting one good driver and Ocon, yeah, but they're wasting a good driver pairing. They really are wasting a good driver pairing, and it's a shame. It's like when you had Button and Alonso at the back of the grid with McLaren, Honda, you don't like to see it. Well, uh, that takes us to the end of our show. Please go and follow my panel at Chris on Racing. Chris is going to be doing lots of tin top commentary soon, so go and watch that. Chris can bring any series to life. And, so yes, that starts in two weeks, and don't forget our Formula E show, which I know we're in a bit of a break between races at the moment, but we are filling that gap with some fun content. Obviously, we spoke to Lucas Degrassi. And that was amazing. A few weeks ago. We actually, a spoke very, to Lucas Degrassi. Very insightful um, interview uh, there about how he got involved in Formula E and helped make it uh, what it is. He and, talked about his uh, F1 year as well. So talked about his time in F1, how that shaped him as a driver as well. I think good just for life lessons that one. But we've got more coming as well. We I say? won't reveal. So I won't reveal who they are, okay. but I will say we've got a Formula E veteran, another one, and another Formula E champion. Yeah, it's, if you're up. into Formula E, like it's the, the we've got the top interviews with the top people, and I'm so so excited about Hell it. Yeah. Uh, Matt, can we get a link to the show notes below? Uh, Chris Catman Turner, you are at Catman F1. You don't have any exciting side projects because you're a grown up with a business. Like you're a, <laughs> you're, a C, you're an executive. You're a CEO of an empire. But go and follow sure. Chris anyway. Uh, go and follow Matt at MattPT55. Matt, there's some MotoGP content coming up this week. Uh, yeah, I believe that uh, Kyle is awakened from his eternal slumber. And there will be a post-testing pre-season review coming up. Uh, we'll be recording this week. And it'll be worth watching well. for Kyle's rants alone because Liberty Media look like they're going to be buying MotoGP. Oh, yeah. And I'm Kyle, sure we'll talk about that a bit. And Kyle is f livid. Uh, follow me, obviously. I'm the best one at Spanners Ready. Check out our merch in the show notes below there. I, I want people walking around tracks with whose fault is it and uh, wrong but first. So go and have a look there. See if there's anything that, that takes your fancy. Um, if you consider supporting us at patreon.com, forward slash missed apex we would absolutely adore you for it we don't have a boss we have a thousand boss bosses we are collectively the the top independent podcast and it's because you guys pay for time for us to improve and grow in missed apex podcast me and matt just don't feel pressure to do other things instead of what we want to do on missed apex podcast we can do what we want because of you patreon.com forward slash missed apex ad free feed join us in the live slack extra content like me and matt did yesterday we ended up waffling for an hour and 20 minutes a couple of funny tales in there it's the beginning of the month so if you sign up now you won't get charged until the end of the month so you've got the whole month to to unsubscribe so you basically get a free month of doing whatever we do until we see you next which should be soon work hard be kind and have fun this was missed apex podcast